Welcome to the United Church of Santa Fe and our series on the Santos of Northern New Mexico. Throughout the years, the United Church of Santa Fe, which is rooted in the New England congregational tradition, has been collecting art from Spanish colonial market as a way of helping to educate, uh, primarily at this point on August 11th, 2000, and August 10th, 2022, helping to educate this congregation about the fact that people have been praying in northern New Mexico for a lot longer than Anglo-Protestants have been here. All the way back to include indigenous peoples, uh, the Tewa, Tiwa, Kersa, and Diné, as well as others, and also for the last several number of centuries, Hispanic, Catholics, and others of different, different traditions. And so here in northern New Mexico, the faith was kept alive uh, the Christian faith was kept alive by santeros, by people who made uh, boltos and retablos and other forms of religious sacred art. When no priests were coming up from Mexico other than maybe once every six months to marry and bury. But throughout that whole history of time, the tradition of santeros has been passed down from one generation to the next. And so today we welcome Juanito Jimenez, who is a very, very good friend of this congregation and also one of the most widely respected Santeros of northern New Mexico. And without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Juanito, and step out of the, step out of the frame. Okay, well, thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, you know, when you look about, look about at Santero art, you go back into the realm of time, of what prevailed here in northern New Mexico, and, you know, I sometimes think of certain dates that have an impact on the history of Santos here in New Mexico. You know, we look at uh, 1598. I'm going to go through a little bit of history here. Uh, Juan de Onate on the banks of the, Al of the Rio Grande River near El, El Paso claims this land for the sovereignty of Spain. So they began their trek down into northern New Mexico and things began to change. You know, it's... Sometimes I look upon the history itself as a dilemma of what happened here in the Southwest, especially to the indigenous people. Uh, 1609, the settlement of San Gabriel was founded. That's an important date. Um, 1680, the revolt, the Pueblo revolt. 1692, uh, De Vargas comes back into New Spain. And things began to really change then. You know, the Franciscan friars see this place as it's a very hostile land. Uh, she becomes the stepchild of Spain, this area. There are no riches to be found. So the Franciscan friars, there's one Franciscan friar by the name of Franciscan friar B and C, and they began to do religious paintings on Hyde. And eventually they take in the indigenous people and teach them how to do it. And... Uh, as time goes on, you know, as the, the period of time goes on, we go to 1821. This area wins their freedom from Spain. Okay, so, geez, things are rapidly changing here. And then 1849, General Kearney comes through here. Then the Santa Fe Trail opens up. So all this is changing here in New Spain. And the only thing that keeps people together here, because Look upon New Mexico as a stepchild. There are no riches to be found here. Life is hard. And uh, the only thing that keeps people together is their religion, Catholicism. And the impact of Santos becomes a reality here. You know, Santos comes as a result, basically, as people come here to um, focus upon their religion and uh, I look upon this as a changing of time, you know. Sometimes you ask a Santero, how did you come about doing this type of work? You know, I remember years ago, I don't have a profound story to tell you how I came to do this. I was walking down the old Santa Fe Trail, and across from the old church of San Miguel was Rex Aerosmith's gallery. I happened to look in the window on a cold winter day, and we were on Christmas break. I was a teacher in the Santa Fe Public Schools. And I looked at this santo. And I said, wow, it just captured my eye. And then I saw my friend, my mentor, 
who is Earl No. I always mention his name and any time I give a presentation because of him I became interested in the Santero art. He took me to the site that day I remember and I was probably about 27 years old, grabbed me by my elbow and he says, John, you need to start doing this. And of course, I myself just being kind of a renegade, I said, why? And he just looked at me and he threw the gauntlet down. He says, because if you don't do this, this art form is dying. You need to start doing it. So that's how I came to do it. And uh, Earl Noe was my mentor. And I mention him all the time because basically you are never really dead as long as someone utters your name. And I utter his name constantly, almost every day of my life. I look at pictures of him and I say thank you for giving this, my part of my heritage, part of my culture. And uh, Santero art has a very much an importance here in New Mexico. I think it brings us together. I look upon New Mexico as a vortex of energy, good karma. We have the indigenous people, we have the Hispano, and the religions come together. Even though that the Franciscan friars embedded Catholicism upon the indigenous people, they kept their faith, which is good. And uh, they have their feast days. And, uh, you know, it's very much part of us, you know. Uh, I thank people like Frank Applegate, people like Mary Austin, or E. Boyd. They saw the importance of this art form back in the 20s. You know, Santero art had become, gone into a recline during the 1860s, 1870s. The Santa Fe Trail opening up, lithographs being brought in from the East, plaster statues. World War I, uh, nobody wanted to be a Santero. I guess in the 1970s, people took an interest in this form of art. You know, this form of art, there are two forms of art, I think, that had its beginnings here on the North American continent. One being the indigenous art of the Native Americans and the Santero art. You know, when I first looked upon the Santero art and as a docent at the Spanish Colonial Art Museum, people always thought that it was very primitive. Yes, but it is a style that is prevalent in this area. Every form of art has its beginnings here. And if we look at the, uh, the linear aspects of it, we could look at Modigliani, we could look at Picasso, uh, uh, and you see that linear line. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's a form of art that I really enjoy. And uh, we have people like, you know, people are not aware of the Santuario de Chimayo. I went there this last weekend, and it brought to my mind that because of the Spanish Colonial Art Society in the 1920s, they bought it from Mr. Aveda, and they gave it to the archdiocese. That is so important. We could have lost this relic in New Mexico. It could have been dismantled and destroyed, and they turned it over to the archdiocese. And uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you know, it's, it's been saved and uh, it's become the Lourdes of the Southwest. Uh, many times I look upon art as itself. I remember, you know, art has, you know, we look at St. Anthony, he's one of my favorites, being the fact is that um, you ask him for special favors. Sometimes you ask him for like, find me health, find me wealth, and find me a good wife. He helps you find these lost things. And if he doesn't answer your prayers, uh, people usually, in the old days, they would turn his back and put him in the corner. <laughs> he didn't do it. Uh, we have saints like San Isidro uh, for good agriculture. And, you know, there's a direct tie with San Isidro here in Santa Fe. Um, he worked on the estate of the de Vargas family back in Spain. His wife was also canonized as part of the church of uh, saints. So there's a direct tie with him there. And... Uh, Sometimes, you know, we look upon uh, the Santeros, you know, life was so hard here, like I said, we were forgotten people here. So this, when we do a retablo, basically we use with, uh, we use wood that is indigenous to this area, uh, ponderosa pine, and then we mix it with animal hide glue and gypsum, and that's your base, it becomes like a miniature fresco. Since we were so far removed from any type of uh, supply, art supplies, the uh, local Santero depended upon materials that he could find here. 
And most likely, I would say that they learned what pigments are used, what plants they use from the indigenous people that lived here. There's some of my favorite colors, just to give you an idea. Scott Andrews did a story about me several months ago on the gathering of soil to paint with. And this one here, just to give you an idea of the richness of colors here in New Mexico, that is the red from La Bajada Hill. Mm -hmm. And if you look there all the time, you'll see where people have been digging there for centuries, for hundreds of years. Not only Hispanics, Hispanos, but also the Native American people. And uh, this one here was given to me by a San Juan Pueblo Indian, uh, Cruz. And uh, it's the yellow ochre. And usually you see when they, during their feast days, they'll, put, they'll paint the, their symbols like that. I once asked uh, Cruz, uh, just show me where I, you, I can get this pigment. <laughs> and he just laughed at me, he says, no can do. <laughs> and I understood why, it was sacred to him. So anytime I run out of that color, and, uh, and then we have the, uh, the green that's gathered here. So, so what I'm trying to say basically is that the Santero most likely learned from the indigenous people what things they use, what plants, and so forth. And uh, this is probably one of my favorites. Uh, this here is uh, Siena from Florence, Italy. My friend Bill Gar brought that for me. <laughs> the same area that Michelangelo used. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, every cultural group has used what's available to them. And uh, usually we find the uh, rocks can be grinded down and made into pigments. So, you know, in Spanish we have a saying that, you know, puedo, de nada puedo hacer mucho out of nothing you can make a lot. And that was, you know, so the artist, the artisan here in New Mexico had to rely on materials like this. You know, sometimes we say, well, uh, I remember people say, the art is so primitive. Keep in mind, the type of art that was occurring in South America was very, very outstanding. It was to be noticed and so forth. This was a style that developed here. We have men like, uh, uh, Rafael Aragón, José Aragón, Benito uh, Ortega, and most important of all, a direct tie that I have with one Santero, José de Gracio González. He came up from Sonora, Mexico, and the decline of the Santero art in 1870 had begun. Santa Fe Trail, Carney, all this occurring. And he revived the Santero art here in New Mexico, and he repainted the, uh, the Rereros in Los Trampas, painted over frescas. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but he did it anyway. And he made his living as an artist. He moved from New Mexico and went with uh, Felipe Baca and Rafael Chacon. Uh, you made, uh, Felipe Baca was the founder of our city in Trinidad, Colorado. Uh, Rafael Chacon was an, a soldier here in New Mexico, a man of honor. If you ever want to read a great book about Rafael Chacon, read his book, A Man of Honor. And uh, Jose de Gracio Gonzalez moved to Trinidad and made a living as a Santero. Unbelievable. I did some research on him and uh, he made an impact there. Uh, he had a carriage house, he had a house. So this was a bad means that he was making a living as a Santero. And you know, during the uh, period of, of saint making, most of these uh, artists traveled from village to village creating these images for families. And these images became very much a part of the family. You know, like if, if you were uh, asking for certain prayers at one time, you probably burned a candle in front of the retablo. And if it got scorched, got the ashes and blessed yourself with it. Mm -hmm trying to get that connection with that santo. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, I've been very, very fortunate that uh, I've been able to do this uh, form of art. Years ago, about five, six years ago, I, I like to make social comments with my art of the dilemma that's occurring here in the Southwest. 
The Good Samaritans at Arizona and New Mexico, my good friend Ted Martinez. I went with him several times down to Tucson and into uh, the Sonorian Desert, and they would gather these plastic bottles that dealt with the migrants coming here to uh, trying to find employment, and they were discarded. And one time he asked me, what can we do with this? And I said, we can use it as a fundraiser for the Good Samaritans. So we, you know, I thought it was a great idea. We started paying maybe 20 jugs, then it was 50, then 100. It became a job, <laughs> but it was fun. And uh, so, and then with that, I did a Our Lady of Refuge. She holds the bomb water going through South America, parts of Europe and so forth, the Middle East of the problems that are occurring. So, you know, there's not only problems here in the Southwest that we deal with, but all over the world. And, uh, you know, uh, we call this, uh, this was called a paper without, a bottle without papers. You know, we all have to have papers to come to the United States. This is a bottle without papers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. we enjoyed this. You know, there, you know, some of you belong to the uh, parish here, the congregation. You know, sometimes just read what's on things. Uh, other things like here's St. Anthony, who I love dearly. My son is named after St. Anthony. When we were first building our home in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, we had, my wife worked at St. John's College and there was Kathy Stack who was one of the workers there. She says, well, pray to St. Anthony and something good will happen. You will strike water. Well, being on a teacher's salary, <laughs> you know, we start drilling for the well. We thought we were going to hit a dry hole. And um, so Kathy asked us, where do you have St. Anthony? I said, well, we have him away from where they're drilling the well. So he's facing towards the well to where Mr. Crocker is drilling. And sure enough, he found this water. <laughs> so, you know, he helps you find lost things. And uh, we built a capilla four or five years ago at our, at our residence. And um, Talitha blessed it for us. And it's named the, the Capilla de San Antonio. So, you know, we always give thanks. And uh, that's uh, the other one that I really, really enjoy doing was the seven last words. And um, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do, the first one. And this became a form of meditation for me as I was doing it. And uh, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother, going down. And uh, this day you will be in heaven with me. I thirst, you know. It just becomes a reflection of meditation, the seven last words, and it's, uh, we look at it and there's uh, just images there, leaves and so forth, and it, it's all symbolic to me. One of my favorite santos is San Francisco de Assisi. And uh, this one was acquired by the church, by the parish, this last finished market. And I did St. Francis basically to show him as a young man, you know, because he was young when he was broke away from his riches and disowned his family. And I put him in a barren area with flowers and birds only and the landscape is bare. So hopefully to me that represents that there is growth, spirituality will grow within that environment. And um, so St. Francis there is very, very important to me. And then this one, you know, we always see St. Francis with just the animals on the, on the earth. This time, I put him in the ocean. <laughs> and uh, that was one of my favorites, and it uh, belongs to the parish here. And uh, so I'm really drawn to St. Francis. And uh, this one here is just um, the works of mercy, the works of war. And I remember doing this basically just the things that were occurring within our world. And they're still occurring. Um, Ukraine, I recall, and I did St. Francis in the colors of Ukraine. And its soul is gone, and both of them are gone. And that was just another social message of what's occurring in our world. And uh, St. Francis, you know, uh, basically, um, 
Canticle Brother Sun, Sister Moon. I did this one where St. Francis is talking to the fire. And this was done for my wife, Joyce, years ago. And, uh, you know, St. Francis is the epitome of, of all saints found here, you know, in the new, in the, especially because he's so identifiable with people. You know, I look upon St. Francis as being the first ecologist <laughs> concerned about our environment, which I wish Congress would be worried about that too right now, but we'll see. Um, here's one of, uh, there are different variations of Mary. Uh, there's, um, Nuestra Señora de Soledad, Our Lady of Solitude. And uh, there was one that uh, I did a Kateri here, a large Kateri if I recall. Yes, well not a large one, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, right, like we're standing on a yeah. turtle. She's another one of my favorites. She's one of the North American saints. Right, North American right. saint. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one, she's never been canonized by the church, but I am fascinated with Julian of Norwich. Um, all shall be well, all matter of things shall be well. And usually this becomes my mantra for myself when things are not going too good. <laughs> and. Uh, and then this is a replica of Rafael Aragón's Padre de Dios. And uh, this one here is just the Cristo. This one was done all in soil. And it becomes very, very soft. And, uh, and uh, I guess another popular one is San Jose. A patron saint of uh, fathers, patron saint of a home, and also patron saint for a good death. I, you know, sometimes we think about says, you know, this is inevitable that many of us are not going to be here another 20 years or 25. And uh, I sometimes wish for a good death for myself, and uh, hope my prayers are answered. Uh, this one here is just a, a repetition where I reverse the images. Uh, to me, it's Mary and Elizabeth. And, you know, both are going to be our children that day, sometime soon, so. And um, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them, if I possibly can. <laughs> Do you have any? Let me just step back in. Um, thank you, Juanito, so much for both for your art and also for ex taking the time to explain it and how much it is connected to the earth and how much it's connected to northern New Mexico. And one of the things that has always um, inspired me by, by your art is that you always, except for the one under the sea, um, <laughs> you, set, you set these ancient stories, whether it's the story of Francis or the story of Mary or Jesus or whomever, in northern New Mexico. It's not, you know, you're not painting Renaissance figures. You're not no. painting, um, you're not even painting what actually perhaps the area around Jerusalem or Nazareth looks like, even though it's desert. But you very much set it within a northern New Mexico context. And I think that, that that's a real gift to the rest of us, whether we're native or newcomer or somewhere in between, because it reminds us that this ground is also sacred ground. And, and that, that what happened thousands of years ago continues, can, can continue to happen in our lives if we're, if we're open to it. It, it, it continues, you know, mm -hmm. basically uh, the land is part of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago I was asked, um, uh, I was interviewed by Good Morning America and they asked me a question about New Mexico. And I remember, I don't know why, why I said this, but it just came out this way. And it sounds kind of corny, but to me, it was something really realistic and meaningful to me. I said, basically, New Mexico is, my, is like my wife. I hope she never leaves me. This is the way <laughs> I feel about New Mexico. Mm. So I am directly tied with New Mexico, you know. Uh, Ancestry uh, goes all the way back to the colonial period, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's just, uh, I'm here for the duration, I think all of us are, <laughs> you know, it's, I'm not going to leave, the only way I'm leaving is when I'm called upon to leave, <laughs> that's right. but uh, New Mexico is a very, very special place in my heart, 
and um, I look out on top of the hill every day and watch the sky fade, and I bless myself. Mm -hmm. And I thank my friend Earl Nell because he made it all possible for me mm -hmm. to enjoy my culture and see the richness in it. Uh, you know, sometimes we look upon the Hispanic people, you know, basically, um, life was hard in New Mexico. The only thing that kept them together was their religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, this became an attribute of theirs, and uh, it still exists today. And what's a great thing about it is that people here in New Mexico have found an appreciation for this form of art, mm -hmm. and that's meaningful to me and to every other artist on here in New Mexico. Uh, as you know, as you walk upon the soil, always keep in mind that others have walked upon that ground too. Mm -hmm. Last Friday, um, I recall that uh, two of my former students, somehow, I had Jane as a student too, many, many <laughs> years ago, and two young ladies came to the house and uh, their daughter, Hannah, who is also a teacher and has taught 16 years, and with all this amount of rainfall that we have had, she was looking on a slope there, and she found a big arrowhead. Mm. I've lived on this mm. property for 45 years, and I've never been that fortunate <laughs> to find it. So that alone yeah. tells me, hey, this land is sacred. People have been here for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at Folsom Man, we look at uh, Sandia Man, we look at the footprints down at White Sands, they're going back 30,000 years. Hey, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there is something sacred about this land. I sometimes think of New Mexico as a vortex of good karma all mm -hmm. coming together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of different faiths. You know, you don't have to be Catholic or Lutheran or Presbyterian or Episcopalian or non-denomination. Uh, we all belong here. Mm -hmm. And this is what makes us so great. As appreciation of art, the art becomes very much a part of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, right. And your ability, um, Juanito, to to use these ancient or at least historic forms of art, I mean, that's part of what Spanish colonial art is. It's not part of the contemporary art, it's, it's the colonial art um, or the historical art. But it's also, you also always bring it, you bring it into what's going on. Um, I mean, like the like painting the the water bottles and reminding us. And I also have a small Santo. Um, it may still be in my office, where you have Jesus um, as a young boy with his parents behind him, and the and what you've written underneath it is Jesus was a refugee too. Right. Which reminds us of that ancient story from 2,000 years ago. Is a story that's still getting lived out now. Um, and similarly with the water bottles. Um, but also the, the diverse imagery of how you how you've engaged the story of Francis, um, you know, both in terms of being yes he was very much a young man he was probably only in his twenties when all of that work, when all of that was happening, um, but also um, as you said he he's not just the he, he's not he's the patron saint not just of what lives above land mm -hmm. but also what's down in the sea. You know and, the interesting thing about the young Saint Francis there. When I was painting that, he had a beard. I, yep, you told me I that. I told yep. Talitha that, and I said, no, he's got to be young. <laughs> 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 so he became a young St. Francis. So you sometimes change the image and... Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. In the midst of a painting, you know. And, and then this one, this other one, which I think we got just about three or four years ago, I think it was, I think it was the year before the pandemic hit, on where you talk about the works of mercy, feed the homey, mm -hmm. feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give drink to the thirsty, etc. Um, and then the works of war, destroy crops, mm -hmm. uh, destroy land, seize food supplies, destroys homes. Long before the invasion of Ukraine happened, for sure, but it still is relevant. But as you and I also talked, um, or you, Joyce, and I talked a few weeks ago, I think it was 4th of July, Fourth of July. talked about the fact that Francis, one of, the, one of the understandings of Francis of Assisi that I've come to in the last few years is that he was also a prisoner of war who suffered from PTSD. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and that also puts a whole new light on who Francis was and why he did what he did. But that, but that long before we had our conversation, you had juxtaposed mercy and war mm -hmm. um, in, in your characterization of Francis. You know, like uh, sometimes you, uh, St. Christopher, mm -hmm. did he exist? 
mm-hmm. you know, the church say that he's been defrocked, he's no longer a saint, supposedly. <laughs> but you know, St. Christopher is St. Christopher to me. You know, right. I still look upon him as helping me on my travels. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I, I take any bit of help that I can find. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I want to cover all the bases. That's uh, right. That's right. You know, uh, this one here, uh, Santa Rosa de Lima. Mm-hmm. I was always fascinated with Santa Rosa de Lima, and about five years ago, we were able to visit her gravesite in Lima, and San Martín de Porte. In, 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 in Peru? In Peru. Wow, and, wow. And, uh, That's great. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I think we have, uh, I think most humanity and good people are saints too. That's right. We don't need to be canonized <laughs> by right. the Catholic Church. I think basically sometimes people ask me, well, did these people actually live? I answered them very honestly. I says, no, they may not have existed, right. but they are, they are to teach us to lead a good life. Absolutely. They have a story yep. to tell us. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, I think if all humanity would just listen to each other, <laughs> we could get along and uh, be a great world. But, um, you know, I'm very thankful that I was able to pursue this art form. And mm-hmm. I, thank, I thank Mr. Noel all the time and mm-hmm. anybody that I've encountered. A lot of friends of mine uh, influenced me, and, uh, and I've met a lot of great people through mm-hmm. this art form. Absolutely. And that's the great thing about doing this. Mm-hmm. Well, we thank Mr. Noel, too, and all mm-hmm. the other people who have been your teachers, and we thank you very much. Juanito, you have really blessed this congregation for decades with your art and with your understanding. And I think you've helped, you've certainly helped me, and I know you've helped this congregation understand far more deeply and far better what it means to be a person of faith in this sacred land. So thank you. Thank you for saying this sacred land. It is sacred. It is indeed. It's a very special place. And uh, even as you walk out the door today, Remember, your footprint has been embedded upon another footprint that has gone through this area. Amen. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here, and thank our audience for being here as well. Thank you. This concludes this particular part of the series, and again, thank you, Juanito. Thank you. um, And also, Joyce, for being here today with us. Thank you. Thank you.